So you, your name is Kendall, right? Yes. Uh, is it pronounced correctly? Kendall Reeves. So hi everyone, uh, tonight we are extremely happy uh, to welcome and to host the United States. Uh, so tonight we have uh, Kendall Reeves, uh, who is uh, an, an inspiring uh, teacher. Uh, so hi Kendall. Hi, great to be here. So, uh, so tonight Kendall uh, will uh, share with us uh, her experience uh, in her university and uh, she will also talk about uh, her project uh, as an aspiring teacher and uh, she will uh, share with us uh, a lot of uh, interesting stuff so uh, Kendall uh, will you please uh, do a little introduction about yourself and about uh, you know a little about your uh, uh, you know uh, institute or uh, yes university and then we can go, uh, you can share your presentation. And uh, when you finish the presentation, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, engage in a uh, discussion. So welcome again. Sounds good. All right, I made a PowerPoint, so I'm going to present it right now. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is a little, bit a little bit about my journey to becoming a teacher. My name is Kendall Reeves. A little bit about me. I was born and raised in California. I have two siblings, an older brother and a younger sister. Um, both my parents are teachers as well. Um, my dad has actually worked his way up from being a teacher to a principal to a superintendent of schools. Um, I love reading. I love English. Um, I'm minoring in English as well. And um, on the bottom left here, this is a, a sky view of my campus, of my uh, uh, my university. It is uh, the most beautiful place and it is located right on the central coast of California. So I'm really lucky to be going there. So my school is California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, California. It is a public school. Um, it was founded in 1901. We have approximately 21,000 students. That was taken about two years ago. Um, uh, together, we have about 3,000 faculty and staff members. Like I said previously, we are located on the central coast of California. So it's about a 10 minute drive to the, the beach, the Pacific Ocean. It spans about a little bit over a thousand acres. Acres. It's a very big school. It's very big in agriculture as well. So we need a lot of land for farming and um, those agriculture students. It is the second largest land holding university in California. At Cal Poly, there's a total of 65 bachelor degrees, 39 masters, 84 minors, and 13 credentials that you are able to get there. And our motto is learn by doing. And as a future teacher, this is something that has really hit home with me. And um, I put a quote underneath that says, tell me and I'll forget, teach me and I'll remember, involve me and I'll learn from Benjamin Franklin. And we are very big, we are very big on interacting and actually putting everything to use and doing things for ourselves. So we learn by doing. These are just a few pictures of my campus. 
Um, we have an aerial view. We have, this is a library. We have just, this is our science building. We have beautiful new renovated buildings. Um, and then these are our new dorms up here as well. So it's a very, very nice campus and I'm very grateful to be going there. Am I able to start with my presentation? Yes, of course. Uh, so okay. go ahead. Okay, so that was my introduction. Um, so I am a currently a fourth year student. Um, I graduate in next year of spring. So I'm in what we call the liberal studies program. So I'm majoring in in liberal studies, which is elementary education, essentially. Um, I also am minoring in, and concentrating in English. Um, so on the homepage of the liberal studies program, you can find seven learning objectives. And I think these resonate very well with the program. And I would just like to read off some of them. Um, so one of the, the first one is examine the importance of the physical, social, and cognitive development of children and their application to learning. So even though we are, we are teachers, we still have to take into account for who we are teaching. And we really have to get to know the student and how they are able to learn, not just the content. We learn um, a lot more than just the content. Uh, we learn how to teach the students, how to present content to the students, how to adjust content to the students. So um, I'm very grateful I'm, I'm able to not only learn, um, you know, the textbook stuff to teach the, the students, but I'm also able to learn how to um, really connect with them. And that's something I appreciate about uh, the liberal studies program. Um, the last one is very important to me too. And that one says, Demonstrate engagement as an agent for change and diversity and inclusion using principles of social justice, equity, and ethical practice. Um, I think that's one of the big ones on the learning objectives, especially um, present day. Um, as a teacher, you have to make your students feel safe and welcome in your classroom. And using these principles and practices is something that's very important to make sure they feel safe and included. Um, no matter who they are, what they look like, et cetera. This is my, um, they call it a flow chart. So basically it is categorized um, by the four years, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and going down, these are all of the classes that I take in that year. Um, my School is on a quarter system, which means we have fall, winter, and spring. So I change classes three times a year, essentially. Um, this, I just feel I'm such a visual learner and this flowchart really lays out um, basically from start to finish my end goal of all the classes I need to take to become a teacher. Um, as you can see, it's a very widespread with the different classes we are needed. We're basically um, an, an elective major, which means we teach or we have to take uh, basically every subject because essentially that's what teachers are going to teach students. They teach them um, a broad range of subjects. So I've taken any everything from biology to history to statistics to geography and then to even performing uh, performance arts in the elementary classroom where we learned different keys and how to sing on pitch um, different ways we're able to incorporate music in the classroom to, to help students learn um, I cannot ask for more enjoyable classes I'm so lucky that I've been able to enjoy every single class that I've taken I cannot say I've had a bad liberal studies teacher um, it's, I've just been really lucky with everything I've got to take. Um, everything is in yellow is required for my major. And the pink is my, is, so this is designed for me. So since I'm in English concentration, everything in pink, I've had to take to get my, my concentration in English. Um, and then of course we've had to take 
still had to take some general education classes that were not included in our in our um, four year plan, but uh, I just wanted to include this because it gives me or it lays out my um, journey really nicely and um, it just really shows how diverse liberal studies stu students are with their coursework. Um, and I think having classes in every single subject imaginable is can not prepare me better as a teacher. I think the liberal studies program really hit the nail on the head with um, the, the coursework they picked out for us to become future teachers. So I'm currently a fourth year, so I'm not in the teaching credential program yet, but when I graduate in spring, uh, I will be applying for the multiple subject teacher education preparation. Um, that's the M step. So since I want to teach elementary school, I will go into multiple subject and it is a three quarter program, small class sizes. It follows Cal Poly's learn by doing and it takes a year to complete to get my actual credential to then go into the classroom to become um, an official teacher. So this would just be the period where I'm learning um, how to become um, like, not, not so much of the content that I was doing in the four years, but more just like um, unit, like planning units, like more of like the logistics and Cal Poly's multiple subject program actually has a 99% hiring rate. After um, we finish a year, they have a 99% hiring rate. So they've been very successful in getting students who apply to the program to go out immediately and become teachers, which is very nice. So like I previously stated, I also have a minor in English. Um, the last bullet are the classes I've had to take to attain, obtain my minor uh, in everything from British, British literature to linguistics to reading all the great books. Um, so since I am such an uh, English nerd, I really could not have asked for a better um, minor. I've enjoyed every single class I've taken, just like my liberal studies classes. I've been very grateful to have such amazing professor professors in both liberal studies and English. Um, one of the classes I just took was teaching English in secondary schools. And in this class, I was able to plan a unit plan that coursed over the span of three weeks. And these were all the things it required. It took me a very long time and it made me really <laughs> appreciate all of my teachers for planning, um, for really going in depth and planning with the lessons and um, the rubrics and just how they're gonna present uh, coursework to me. So it gave me uh, a really good practice for when I'm a teacher to plan my own unit plan or that I'm able to use this and implement it in my classroom one day. Okay, so I came on here to talk about some of the best teaching practices that I have learned uh, over my four years as an undergrad student at Cal Poly. Um, just a side note, I have not been able to implement these in my own classroom yet since I am not an official teacher, but I have done volunteer work in schools and I've been able to get that firsthand experience. And um, I, these are the, the three that really hit home with me over my four years that I think I would definitely want to implement in my own classroom and I think um, will really be beneficial to the students that I am teaching. The first one that I have is portfolios and social media. Um, in two of my classes, I actually, I took a, a, a math class for elementary school teachers. It was specifically designed for elementary school teachers. And I was able to create a Google site, um, which was essentially my portfolio of all of the work. It was, um, it was four classes I had to take. It was a series. And I was able to put all my work I did in those four math classes onto a Google um, site. I'm actually going to open it up just to show briefly. Um,
if it will load. I think I might already have it open here. Okay, here we go. Um, so I was able to put all of the lessons, all the reflections I ever did for this class um, compiled into one website, which is just a walking portfolio for me to show peop, um, administrators that I'm going to be interviewing with. This is uh, all the work I've done and it's all compiled into one website. I've even made picture books. I've created lessons. I've made math games. I have um, made YouTube videos on how to solve math problems in um, a non-standard way because with this class, we had to learn how to teach students um, not only how to complete the math problem, but we had to learn how to teach it in various ways because something I've learned um, that's very important, is not all students learn the same. And that's something that teachers need to take into account when they're teaching that they need to provide multiple ways or multiple paths that students can take to reach the end solution. Um, another thing that I have learned to be helpful is the use of social media. So in one of my classes, I was required to create a Twitter account, um, which is how I got asked to be presenting here today. I was uh, networked and uh, discovered through Twitter. Um, this, you can do it. Uh, it might seem scary for social media for students because they do have the power to abuse it, but um, as long as you are monitoring monitoring their um, activity. It's a great way to um, assess in ways that don't feel like assessments. You can use, uh, have your students tweet as a use of exit tickets as they're leaving the classroom. Um, so I just believe that finding ways to teach students in ways that don't feel like assessments but are is very important because personally for me, I loved making the portfolio because I'm, I'm a creative person and I'm a visual learner and having different ways to show what I've learned besides a sit down multiple choice test is very important for me that I will definitely implement in my classroom when I'm a teacher because you have to find different ways to reach all of your learners because not everyone's a test taker. So you have to be able to prevent or present activities and assignments to your students um, in ways that all students are able to benefit from. Another one that is very important that I also learned in a previous class of mine is to implement community building openers. And what this is, is essentially, especially since online, it's been hard for me to meet and interact with my classmates since it's all through the screen. So what my teacher did, which I thought was amazing, was before every class, she had, um, what she called a community building opener and either she presented it or she had one of the students present it. And it's just essentially an icebreaker, but I was able to learn so much more about my classmates through these little games. And it kind of just um, made the classroom more, a, more of a safe environment. And I was able to um, really get to know my peers, but in a way that didn't feel like work. It was, uh, fun activities. So some examples we did was two truths and a lie, where we all had to write down two truths about our, ourselves in one line. We had to present it to the class and then our classmates would try to guess which one was the lie. Um, Jamboard discussions. Jamboard is a website where you are able to go, anyone with a link is able to go and post a sticky note or a comment on, on the essentially like a cork board of you ask a question and they can answer it. For younger kids, you can have show and tell. Um, and one of the things we did that I thought was very fun is um, we used the jam board and you could either put a meme, a GIF or a song to describe your morning. So we took about 10 minutes in the beginning of class before class started and we just had fun with it. We posted a picture of how our morning was going and then we were able to talk about it with um, our classmates. So it just kind of eased the tension before the work started and it doubled as getting to know my peers better. Um, and I think this is great for students, like I said, especially if it's online um, you, because they have access to 
the links and to different websites that they are able to interact with their peers since it can't be face to face. So I think implementing something like that to get to know your students and for them to get to know their classmates is very important. And the last teaching practice that I have just, um, re that really just stuck with me was the importance of home language. Um, as a California teacher or as a future California teacher, we have a lot of students whose first language is not going to be English. Um, and it is essentially our job to help them get to the English level we hope for them to be on track with their other students whose first language was English. But one of the things that I have noticed that teachers seem to get lost in is that yes, teaching English is the end goal and you want your students to become proficient in speaking English, but it doesn't mean they have to get rid of their first language. And I think in a lot of situations, teachers try so hard to get their students to learn English that they want to completely wipe out their home or their first language. But I think that it can be used as, um, it can benefit them to first be bilingual and efficient in both, but to use their home language to get to that English proficiency. Um, how to incorporate home language in your classroom. You can ask your students to share and teach others about their culture or their language. Um, this not only gets the students who are being presented to um, a way to get to know their um, classmate, but it also makes the Eng English language learner feel more accepted in the classroom if they're able to show off their home language and teach their peers about a little bit about their, themselves. Um, and one of the big things that I've learned is scaffolding. And I will get into that after a couple slides, but scaffolding and using home language is something that has been very important in what I have learned um, in my teaching practices. So just, I just wanted to give a quick uh, statistics just about um, English language learners, especially in my area. So the California average is 20% of K through 12 public school population are English language learners. And just in my um, county where I go to school alone is 13% of the school population, which is a lot. Um, so I think that's why my school has been teaching it so much, just because there is uh, such a heavy population, especially in California and in San Luis Obispo, where I am, that it's very important to know um, that as a teacher, you have to be able to help the students not only reach the English um, end goal, of being proficient, but to also help them incorporate their home language as well and not to completely get rid of it. Um, how you are able to help students with their home language, I've learned the importance of incorporating both integrated and designated lessons. Um, designated, you the teacher starts off, uh, has alone time with a circle of English language learners. Um, just essentially so the teacher can provide language clarification um, to give them to present the English language learners new vocabulary um, for the lesson that she's going to prepare to have them um, just to give them background information about what she's going to talk about because a lot of times the students coming in who aren't English proficient they don't have a lot of awareness of English history or um, just vocabulary that students who are already English proficient and English as their first language might have. So that's a time for the teacher to get a little one-on-one -on -one time with the English language learners and to kind of preface them and prepare them for what will be the integrated lesson. And that is when the whole class comes together and they learn the lesson, but now the students and the designated lesson, so the students who first language isn't English, they are able to feel more involved and connected in the conversation and they are able to talk to their peers about what is being taught because they've had that previous, um, they've had that previous talk, they've had that previous talk that this, the teacher was telling them, they've had the previous information, they've been prepared to collaborate with their peers. So I think that's very important. So they are able to feel more needed in the conversation. Because a lot of times, if the 
English language learners are trying to have a conversation with the students who already know English, it's a lot more difficult if they aren't aware of um, the terms they're using or just the overall context of what is being taught. Uh, going back to scaffolding. So basically what scaffolding is, is temporary assistance, the emphasis on temporary. So it's like a stepping stone. Um, teachers help the learner know how to do something now so that they are able to imitate it by themselves in the future. And this is very important for English language learners. Um, there are four types of scaffolding support. The first one is linguistic support. And like I previously have been emphasizing, home language is a great linguistic support. Um, using vocabulary in sentences and really getting into those key terms. And then redundancy and rephrasing for emphasis. Um, the second one is graphic support, and that can include charts, tables, graphs, timelines, basically visuals for them to understand what you're trying to teach them. Sensory support is anything from manipula manipulatives, things they can touch, models they can see, pictures, um, especially if they're visual learners. And then interactive support is a big one uh, to put them in pairs, small groups, or even one-on-one -on -one time with tutors. But that collaborative portion of the interactive support is very important. Um, not only so they can feed off of each other's ideas, but to, uh, to hear new ideas and to, to get help so they don't feel alone. Um, so scaffolding is a very important part of teaching because you're able to provide your students tools that they can later use um, if you're not able to be around, but you're, you're giving them that first push, you're giving them that stepping stone to then go on and be able to do things on their own. I was able to actually create a Martin Luther King Jr. lesson for kindergartners um, in one of my classes that I wanted to just share briefly because I think it was very important that I included not only the content standard of history, but I included um, standards for English language learners. Um, they do, in California, we do have separate standards for um, English language development. And not only do I have the content standard, but I included two of the language development standards that I'm hoping to get to um, my students that I was teaching. I was actually creating this lesson for a young girl whose first language was Russian. And um, I was able to put in the standards that was benefiting her when, in her English language development to try to help her to understand English better. Um, you can do this with Spanish too. So if you provide new vocabulary to your student, put the word in English, but put it in their home language as well. So, and it could be, uh, you could put it in Spanish so they are able to make that connection. Uh, academic language objective is very important. So before the lesson started, I had just a snippet of what I was trying to accomplish with my student. So I had, after I read the book, a picture book of Martin Luther King Jr. My students will orally describe the life struggles and actions that made Martin Luther King Jr. a social justice hero by using content specific language, new vocabulary and organization skills. So I laid out what I wanted them to do and then I put how I was going to help them do that, which was by the picture book. Um, if it's kindergarten, I had, a, I had a song, I had a picture book. Um, so even though this person was, uh, or this student was not, was home, home language was not English, I still wanted to teach them about Amer American history. And I think that's important, but to also incorporate their home language to use, like I said previously, as a scaffold. Um, so that was an assignment I did and I was very proud of it. So I just wanted to put it in. Um, to conclude, what are my next steps? I have to take the CSET, which is the California Subject Examination for Teachers. Um, I will take the multiple subject one, which is three subtests. And since I'm gonna be an elementary school teacher, that's the one I'm taking to pass, then to go on to my credential. 
Um, I'm going to apply for the multiple subject credentialing program since I'm not quite finished with my undergraduate degree. I still have to apply. Um, I plan on graduating in the spring of 2021, so I'm almost done. And then after that, I'm going to start my credentialing program and my student teaching, which will last one year that will prepare me to go into the classroom. And um, after that, eventually, I hope to get my master's in some sort of English or reading education. To end, I just wanted to end with a quote that um, is very special to me. It says, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I think as a teacher, knowing the content and being able to teach them is one thing, but also being compassionate, empathetic, and um, a support system for your student is a whole nother thing that comes with being a teacher. And I think it takes a very strong person to be able to do, to not only teach them what they need to know, but to also um, care for them as well. And that's why I'm so excited to become a teacher. And that is the end. Great. So I, I am amazed by the uh, quality uh, of your presentation, really. Well, thank you. There are a lot of things you mentioned, and uh, uh, you know, I have a couple of reactions uh, about some of them. Okay. Uh, you said that, you said that in your university you learn by doing. Yes. Uh, uh, do you have like uh, some sort of uh, project-based learning, or uh, what is oh, exactly yeah. the the con the concept that you do in learn by doing? Yes, learn by doing is very project-based. Um, it is also very lab, laboratory based. So um, I had to take these physical science classes in my first year of um, as a liberal studies major. And we didn't just work out of a textbook, we did the experiments and um, whatever we were trying to figure out the equations we were trying to figure out in the textbook, we not only completed them, but we did them. So we had to learn about um, weight and um, speed and cars and we actually got down on the floor and we tested it and we we did these trials over and over again until we were able to get what we found on paper because as a teacher we are not going to just be showing them how to do it on paper we actually have to make sure that what we're teaching them is accurate so um, learn by doing is all about so like I said, we learned how to do it on the paper, but we learned by actually doing what we were trying to solve for. And I think as a teacher, doing and showing and modeling for your students is such a good way to get um, them to really understand what you're trying to teach them because it's one thing to just show them how to, how to solve for an equation, but it's another thing to show that it actually works. So not only Cal Poly, um, but liberal, the liberal studies major was very um, well versed in learn by doing and my entire major was is and still project based and that's something I really appreciated because um, I'm such a visual and kinesthetic learner that I have to do actually act out what I'm trying to solve. Um, and I feel like having Cal Poly's motto learn by doing really helped me understand the content so much better. Yes, and it actually makes sense because if students just watch the teacher talking for like 60 minutes or so without any actual practice, this will make them feel bored. And Exactly, yes. It, it, it won't serve any, any, any purpose. Yes. Yes, getting them involved is very important to not, like you said, so they don't feel bored, but so they actually understand. Um, what we are trying to teach them by them physically being able to see it for themselves and not just trust everything that the teachers are telling them. Yes, they have to doubt everything the teacher yeah. <laughs> has to tell them. <laughs> okay, you also mentioned that students uh, should be uh, safe and included. Why yes. safe and included? Uh, because because of the different backgrounds you have? 
maybe? Yes, definitely. You have different cultural background? Yes. Um, that is one thing that we, especially in my last year of being a liberal studies student, I've really emphasized because I, I learned a lot from my theories, mes methods, and assessment classes for English language learners. And one of the things that really hit home with me is I took um, a linguistics class, not only for my, I had to take it for my major, but my minor. And my professor presented all of us, she got us in groups and she presented all of us with a new language that we've never seen a new alphabet and we had to try to decode it. And I just remember in that moment, I was, I've given up. I didn't know how to, where to start. I didn't know if I was doing anything right. And when she was finished, it really put things in perspective for me that these students are coming into your classroom and they're looking at English, like, it, cause it is, a, it's to some of them, it's a foreign language. They don't know anything about it. Um, and they're going to feel scared and confused, um, especially if you aren't taking that one-on-one -on -one time with them and trying to make them feel um, included and safe. Because, or it, because if once you take that time to take the student aside and try to teach them um, English proficiency, they're going to feel more involved in the classroom, like they are able to have. Um, something to say when you're teaching the whole class, they're not going to feel like they're out of the loop. And I think especially with different cultural backgrounds, you have to make sure that your students are heard and you have to make sure that their, um, their cultures are being represented in your teaching. And like I said previously, um, a good idea that I want, want to implement in my own classroom is, um, first of all, taking a survey at the beginning of the school year, just trying to take it home to the parents, trying to get a, a sense on what languages they speak, um, where are they from, just kind of like a background information, and then use that to have your students uh, do like a show and tell thing where they're able to go in front of the classroom and tell their, their classmates a little bit about themselves and a little bit about the culture because it's going to be different. I mean, California is a huge melting pot of different ethnicities and cultures. And I think we just get so stuck in the idea of English is the end goal that we forget to implement and encourage other languages and cultures in our teaching. And I think once teachers are able to do that, then students are able to feel more safe when coming to school not only safe in the community, but safe and inspired and that they have that support system to show that, oh yeah, my teacher um, and my students, they really like what I had to say about where I'm from. And I just, I just feel like they understand me better. And I think having that sort of respect in a classroom is so essential, not only for a student teacher relationship, but student to student. Yeah, great. Yes, uh, I think incorporating culture in teaching is, uh, is, is, is really important. Yes, very especially, important. Especially, especially in, a, in, a, in a context, in a rich, uh, in a, con a context full of uh, cultural uh, you know, ethnicities, as you have said. Yes. Uh, you, you also mentioned the music. I am a huge fan of using mu music in the classroom. I mean, teaching with song. Yeah. Uh, so how you guys use, uh, use music in the classroom? Or I music? was able to take a performing arts um, class last year um, that was in person. So I'm, I'm grateful I got to do it in person. Um, it was one of the most fun classes I've ever taken. We were able to, my professor would play guitar and we were able to learn how to match his pitch and the whole class would be harmonizing. And I learned the keys. Um, I learned uh, what a B note. I learned a quarter note. Um, I learned uh, one of our assignments was we had to create a dance either by ourselves or with a partner. And we had to dance in front of, like that was my, that was my final project was to dance in front of my class. 
Um, and just, it, it made teaching fun. And we learned how to use songs to teach them the alphabet, how to teach students about different kinds of uh, food or colors. And we learned how to incorporate that in song. And we also learned how to, we learned about theater. So we learned how to put on plays about um, everyday what songs. Have you chosen? What songs did I learn? What songs have you chosen for this? Oh, what songs have I chosen? Um, oh gosh, this was a year ago. I, I learned a song. The only, the, the, one of the things that stuck with me was, um, it was actually a theater performance that um, I, I created. I created a script um, and I had my classmates act it out and it was about like changes and puberty for like middle school students. And it was just so fun because it was through the act, it was theater and I learned costumes and um, how to write a script, how to format it. But I learned like I could also present that in my class to make like it funny, but to also teach my students things. Um, I cannot remember, um, obviously the um, ABCs, there's month songs. I learned a song about Martin Luther King Jr. and that I can sing to my students um, to teach them who he was, but to do it in a way that's easy for them to remember. Cause like the repetitiveness of a song is a good way a good uh, linguistic scaffolding uh, support. I asked you, uh, I asked you about the songs because uh, not all the songs are teachable. Uh, some yeah. songs are full of, uh, you know, uh, full of uh, terms or, uh, you know, words that are not, uh, that are not understandable by students. That's why mm -hmm. I asked you about the songs. Yeah, that's, that's definitely um, can be a roadblock, but I think knowing first having taught um the keys and different notes to get the music and then um but in the song you're able to you know define the terms that they might be confused about so when they're uh thinking about the song they're saying it over and over again so um because in in the martin luther king jr song that i found for the kindergartner i was trying to teach um it in the song it told them who he was and what he did by singing and just having the same repetitive verse so when you ask them about oh who was martin luther king jr they are able to go back in the song and sing it to you um, but also when they sing it it tells them you know the person asking what they did so i think incorporating music in the classroom is is such a good idea especially for younger students and when i volunteered in a kindergarten classroom, all they did was sing and they would play a CD player. And in the morning they would just, they get so excited about picking songs. Um, but the songs, of course, you know, they had meaning behind them. So I think that's such a great way to learn because student, the little kids will sing it, but they, um, they don't think of it as like an assignment or that they're learning. They just think that they're playing music and singing and having fun, which is what it should be about. Yes, great. You, you. I, I sense that you, you are a huge fan of Martin uh, uh, Luther King. <laughs> huge fan. <Right>? Um, <laughs> I, I just spent um, a good amount of my time. I taught a lesson about him, and I made a lesson plan. So, um, uh, regarding history and an American hero. So I know I have been talking about him a lot, but that's just what I've most recently. Um, the lesson I created, so it's it's stuck in my head because I just had to teach it and present and submit it as my final project for one of my classes. So, um, and I learned a lot, and I incorporated all the I incorporated books and music and um, scaffolding in that one assignment. So I was able to use everything I learned to teach that assignment about him. So, um, I think it was a great thing for me to teach to young students, um, especially if you don't, you know, obviously you have to censor a lot of things, especially for kindergartners, but just to get the idea of who these people were in American history is such a um, important thing, even if you're only telling them um, little things here and there. But um, 
yeah, I'm a fan of him. <laughs> that's great. Yes, that was very interesting, really. Uh, so uh, you you mentioned also that uh, you use tweet uh, you use tweet as exit ticket. Uh, yes. It's in teaching, right? Um, in one of my classes, I was actually one of my assignments was uh, to I had to compose a tweet every week of either what I've learned or something regarding English or reading. Um, and then one of the reflective questions at the end of the assignment was, how are you able to use Twitter in your own classroom? So one of the answers that I came up with was to use them as a form of exit tickets. Um, so have every student in your class create a professional Twitter account, not a recreational one. So that's what I did for my class. And then um, at the end of whatever lesson you're teaching, you could just say, okay, class, before you go, tweet one thing you learned today or answer this question I have on the board and that will be you know, your, your exit ticket. So it's your participation um, for the day. And it's also assessing what you learned. Like I has, have emphasized assessing without, um, you know, making it such a, a daunting task or assessing in ways that don't feel like you're assessing, but as a teacher, you're still able to get the information from what they tweeted and take it and see, okay, they understand this, but we need to work on this more. Yes, very interesting. Uh, so uh, I am uh, I am also, I like, uh, I like portfolios a lot. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I use them, uh, for, uh, also in my classroom practice, I use them to assess. I use them to uh, to make students uh, track their progress. Yes. Their learning progress. You you mentioned it. Uh, you know, uh, you have your own portfolio, right? You you shared with us a site in which you document your experiences. Yes, so, that uh, was my math portfolio. Yes. Oh, okay. This was your math portf portfolio. Yes, I also do have a separate uh, account. Please. Can you share with us the link, maybe in the chat box? Oh, the math portfolio, yeah. Yes. Do you use it with, for example, uh, my, my comment was about uh, using it uh, for informal assessment for students. Yes. I'll share my portfolio. Um, yes, so I, Okay. In my math series, I was able to create my portfolio for a span of four years, and it has everything I've done from reflections to multiple choice um, tests that I've made for students that I'm able to use to I created a math picture book. Um, I have group projects. So this is a way for students, like you said, to track their progress and to keep everything so um, they could also use it to put in their best work that they submit at the end of the school year of the things they want to. So it gives them free will to, for them to put in their best work to the portfolio that they turn in at the end, because they're saying, these are my, this is the best work I've done for you. And I want you to, um, acknowledge this. And I want you to grade me on what I think is my best work. And I think that not only gives students freedom to, um, show you show off what they've done but it also um helps teachers um just see your students progress and see how far they come from their first portfolio entry to their last one um and like i said previously not everyone is a test taker i'm personally not a test taker i would much rather have time and spend time on a project or an essay or like this, I'd rather compile a creative portfolio and hand it to you and say, this is what I've learned. Um, you can grade me on this instead of sitting down and having asked to create or to finish a multiple choice test with short answer. I mean, of course you have to implement that because some people are test takers and it's important to still keep that around for them, but you also have to acknowledge that you are still able to do it in uh, different ways that isn't testing. So like the informal uh, portfolio is a way you're still able to assess your students learning in a way that isn't so 
um, um, pressure that isn't a lot of pressure like a chess situation would be. So it kind of um, gives them a, a little bit more uh, freedom and creativity to uh, turn in something that's not so structured and formal. Yes, there are a lot of uh, problems actually with the standardized tests. They actually yes. make students make students very nervous, and uh, you know, they 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 they're, uh, what they call their affective uh, filter uh, becomes high, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. they, that's not that's not a, a good way of uh, testing. Uh, so uh, you, uh, there is a comment on Facebook uh, about uh, what kind of culture uh, you should focus on. You have Australian, you have uh, Moroccan, <laughs> you have British. So what, what kind of culture uh, you think uh, sh uh, we should focus on in order to teach? Or maybe a combination of all these things. What yeah. kind of cultures you have there? I don't think um, there's one right answer to this question. I think you, that's why it, it was so important to survey your class at the beginning of the year to see what mix of cultures you have in, in um, your classroom among your students, because you don't wanna, I mean, it's important for them to be well-versed in many cultures, but you wanna to try to focus on which ones you're dealing with in your class for that year. Um, so they're able to feel heard and you're able to, as yourself as a teacher, learn a, a little bit of, more about them. Um, I don't think there's one specifically you should focus on, but just to kind of um, get an understanding of your class and then go from there when, when you're planning your lessons to um, incorporate that or to take an account for the holidays that you know they celebrate but that um, a majority of your other classmates will not. Um, just, just things like that. I just think it's important to focus your um, lesson planning and uh, on what you have right in front of you and your students. So I don't think there's one specific one you should, but I think just a combination of what's in front of you is what you should focus on. Yes, the, the, the problem with this is that, uh, especially in teaching, when you have uh, uh, different students from different backgrounds, yeah. uh, and their, uh, their first language is not English, uh, you know, the teacher, uh, you know, finds uh, himself, uh, you know, uh, you know, students sh uh, student use their, their first language, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, some teachers uh, do the uh, translation method. They, translate from uh, English to the first language. But they say this uh, translation me method is not effective. So that's why uh, it's a little bit challenging, yes. Yeah, defi it's definitely a challenge, but I think a lot of times there's challenges that arise that we shouldn't look, as, look at as um, barriers, but to try to figure out how to go about to you know, make this um, to figure out how to solve it and how to um, complete the challenge because teaching is, is you're going to be faced with all these challenges. And I think the challenge of especially of trying to um, teach English language learners is a huge is a big one. And a lot of times teachers, like I said, you know, they forget that it's OK to keep the home language. It's OK to incorporate it um, at the same time to teach them English proficiency, but you have to find the balance because I, I feel like just teaching English 100% is very detrimental to um, themselves. And it also, um, their home language is such an essential part of their identity. And you have to, you know, dual identity, that's a real thing. Uh, you have to be able to accept who they are um, and both their identities and not just try to um, you know, reach, obviously reach the angle of English, but it doesn't have to be the only thing there. Yes, great. Th that was a very interesting session, really.
So uh, you 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 mentioned integrated VAs designated uh, lessons. Yes. Is is it your favorite way of uh, you know designing lessons? Because I think there are a lot of uh, approaches. Why you have focused on integrated and designated? Um, this was another thing that I uh, learned in my class that I just was finished with, and I thought it was. And I I've watched videos of teachers performing this type of. Um, practice in their classroom and I thought it was very beneficial um, and especially if I have a, a high amount of you don't have to do integrated and designated for everything but I think um, for the more difficult things it's important to to have that designated group to, as a teacher to have that one-on-one -on -one time with um, your English language learners to uh, prepare them for what you're about to teach because if you're going in with um, uh, all together and they're going to be lost. So I think it's it's essential to take them aside first and and show them uh, the new vocabulary that you're going to be presenting and um, ask them questions and give them a little background and read them a story about um, what you're going to talk about. Obviously, it can change depending on the lesson. But once you have that group and they feel confident enough to go out and mix in with their class who um, already might have some of the background knowledge that they didn't have previously. I think that's very important to make sure everyone, your, every student um, feels involved and confident in speaking in small groups or sharing with a partner. Um, and I think having this group to the side is very beneficial to make sure that they're understanding what you're trying to teach and that they going back to the safe classroom and having them feel safe in the classroom that they're in by um, recognizing that their teacher is their support system and the teacher wants to take them aside and help them before they go out and you know the real world or to mix in with the class. I think that's very important to incorporate. It doesn't have to be um, in every lesson, but um, I think, like I said, the more difficult ones you should have that time set aside to to help your students who who might who you predict might struggle with what you're about to um, share. Yes. So do you have uh, like uh, separate uh, standards where you teach, or maybe each each state has a separate standards? Because uh, yes. you have mentioned um, the content standard and uh, and uh, so do you do you do you guys have separate standards where you teach? Yes, each state has um, separate standards. Um, California has separate standards, uh, especially for you know the history of because uh, every state has um, you know obviously different history. So that's why when you get your teaching credential, it it really depends on the state you get it in because some states require you to get a separate cred credential for their state that you're going to be teaching in because. The history is a little different because I learned um, in my college classes, I learned all about California history. Um, so California, every state does have different standards. So I did use the ones for um, California. Great. So uh, uh, th that was really a very interesting session. Uh, so maybe we uh, would like to uh, ask you about how how you guys uh, coped with the COVID. Sorry, can you repeat that? I said, how you guys have you uh, coped with the COVID, the virus? Oh. Have you uh, re resorted to online learning maybe? Yes. Um, I think California, United States is... Um, got hit, hit pretty hard, especially California, since um, we have a lot uh, more, st uh, we have stricter reg regulations for COVID and reopening. So my entire last year of college will be online. Um, this has hit me in ways that it's hard because I was so used to going in to the classrooms and volunteering my time and getting that firsthand experience. Um, I'm not able to do that. One of my classes, I was required to meet with a student and create lessons for them and to go and tutor them. But since 
um, everything was online, I was not able to do that. I had to kind of find, we had this website where we just picked a random student we didn't know and just kind of hypothetically made lesson plans. Um, so that was hard because I was really looking forward to the one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, the learn by doing has been a little difficult to um, try to do online since uh, we aren't, I'm not able to physically be on campus. Um, it's been hard, especially for teachers. There's some um, students in my major who have been second guessing whether they want to go straight into teaching because um, they want to be able to student teach in person and they don't want to have to deal with it online. Um, I'm, it's been hard for everyone. I think my teachers have been super great with making sure that um, we're still learning and we're still having fun and we're still interacting with um, our peers in the classroom. So it's been hard on both ends, especially since um, a lot of my major is um, doing and going and, you know, interacting with kids to try to get that experience. It's, it's been hard, um, especially for California. So um, I, I mean, we got great news yesterday with um, a vaccine coming to the United States. So that's promising. Um, but it's definitely been hard for students to try to adapt to um, online learning. You don't like vaccine, obviously. Sorry, what? You don't like vaccine, obviously. Me? Yeah. No, I, I do. I, I'm very hopeful for it. Um, I think this is going to be a great uh, start to try to go back to the in-person learning and um, me being able to return to my campus to get the um, in-person instruction um, when I'm able to do my uh, teaching and student teaching. So I'm, I'm very hopeful um, to, to see, uh, especially with this next year, because um, I, as much as I, you know, like being able to learn from home, I, I miss being able to interact with people in person. So um, it's, it's, it's been hard, but uh, you know, teachers, you're going to fa be faced with lots of challenges. So you have to learn to um, overcome them and to, and to stay optimistic, which is what I'm trying to do. That's great. So do, do you, do you have, do you have a passion for online learning? Do you, do you, do you for example, have like uh, obtained any uh, uh, online certificate or something? No, no? Um, I, I don't. I, I am just hoping that online is temporary for me. Um, I, I don't plan on this being a long term thing. So I don't, I wouldn't say I have um, a passion for online learning. I do think it's a great way to network and, and to um, make things more accommodating by, you know, being in the comfort of wherever you are in the world and um, your own home. It's been easy for me to to uh, stay home and but to still be able to go online and, and take my classes. Um, so I think it's been it's been great, but I don't think I would want this to be long term. That's good. I said at the very beginning that one uh, one of the objectives, one of the, uh, our main objectives uh, in everyone academy is to encourage uh, you know students, university students would like to become teachers and uh, but uh, you obviously uh, Kindle you don't need encouragement because uh, you are uh, already on the right track you are full of passion full of zest uh, you have uh, you know you have uh, you know accomplished a lot of projects you 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 sound like uh, the perfect teacher uh, and I'm not exaggerating because uh, you have, you have. I learned from today's presentation. I learned a lot. I learned from your. Experience. That's great to hear. That really, that really means a lot. Um, I was definitely nervous, especially since I am not officially a teacher and I haven't been able to implement my practices firsthand in the classroom. But um, I'm so excited to, and I've been accumulating all of these things over time, especially from what I've learned in my four years that. I just am finding out all this new information. I'm like, oh, this is great. Like, I can't wait to use this in my own classroom. 
Um, so that, that really means a lot to me that you said that, cause that's the ultimate goal is I just, I hoped, um, I was able to bring a new perspective, especially from, um, a student and, um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm very excited and, um, hopeful and I, I ultimately just want to be a role model and to make a difference. That's my, my ultimate goal. And of course to teach content, but, um, I, I'm really just excited to interact with students and, and to make a difference. Yes, but the idea is that not everyone, uh, not everybody, not everyone knows if, uh, everything. We don't know everything. We we actually we need each other to to learn, because so, and sometimes we learn from our students. Uh, yes. Sometimes you 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 find teachers with uh, like twenty or thirty years of experience and they still learn it. Yeah, so learning the, learning never stops. It's yes, an ongoing process. Yes. So do you have any final comments, uh, suggestions? Uh, I, I just want to, to ultimately thank you for inviting me to be on here and to talk. I think um, it's, it's a great uh, learning experience for me and also a way for me to kind of uh, vocalize what I've been learning and what I've been putting uh, towards for the past four years. Um, I am very excited to go out and have my own classroom and to use everything I've learned from um, myself, my coursework and all of my professors, everyone who's taught me everything. I'm, I'm so excited to be able to finally um, put everything I've learned into practice and ultimately I am so happy that I chose the path to become a teacher. I cannot imagine doing anything else. Um, I think it's very important to enjoy your, your career and to wake up every day wanting to go teach in the classroom. And I already know that this is the right path for me. And I'm very excited to start my journey. Um, or continue my journey to become a teacher. And I just want to thank you again for allowing me to come on here and um, share a little bit about myself and my journey. Yes, you, you are welcome. And uh, we, we, we can also uh, maybe meet you in another uh, future uh, webinar. When you, yes. Uh, when you become certified. And, uh, yes, I would love that. Okay, thank you so much. And, thank you. Uh, and hopefully we can meet uh, soon. Yes, thank you. I hope you have a good rest of your day and a good end of the year. Yes, okay, thank you. And thank bye you. Bye. Bye. bye.